So this lesson is going to go through your classic study for social psychology. Um, so you will need the big A3 sheet to hand and the study is by Sheriff et al. And he looks at intergroup conflicts and cooperation using what he calls the robber's cave experiment. So this is a field experiment that he set up. Make sure you've got your A3 sheets ready and a pen. Uh, you're going to need to take down the information um, throughout the lesson. So Sheriff had two main aims. He wanted to first of all investigate how um, intergroup relations would form over a particular period of time. So he induced various situations to trigger intergroup conflict between his participants. The second aim was to look at the way in which in-groups formed um, through realistic conflict, the effect of competition and whether or not um, competition over things like material um, resources or finite resources would instigate um, realistic conflict and also to see um, if he could reduce those uh, conditions of conflict using what he called superordinate goals. So Sheriff et al set up a field experiment. So remember a field experiment is an experiment that takes place in a naturalistic setting for the participants and yet the researchers still manipulate the independent variables to measure the dependent variables. So this was set up at Robbers Cave Camp in Oklahoma. Um, it's a summer camp um, for children, quite common in America, so it was quite natural for um, his sample to be involved in going to a summer camp. The study was completed in three different stages. So first of all, um, the in-groups were created, um, so they facilitated tasks that required in-group cooperation. So this was first of all to divide the two sets of boys um, into what he called the eagles and the rattlers. The two groups were then brought together in situations where they had to compete against one another. So this was to instigate elements of conflict between the two groups. So they had to do things like uh, tug of war and stuff like that. Finally, he brought in what he called superordinate goals, which was to encourage cooperation between the two groups to see how effective this was in reducing the in-group, out-group hostility. So Sheriff sampled a total of 22 boys. Now, these were selected from a possible 200. Um, it was targeted sampling, so he did actually check the history of the boys. He made sure that um, they had no outward signs of excessive levels of aggression and other participant variables that would skew his data. Um, he sampled them from middle class Protestant families um, using information from schools across Oklahoma City. So the boys themselves were taken from a very culturally specific example. This is really important when you're thinking about cultural differences um, and developmental differences when we're looking at factors affecting prejudice. Um, the boys did not know each other prior to taking part in the summer camp and the parents were paid not to visit the boys during the two week period. So the parents were sort of encouraged to stay away from the boys taking part. The parents did know that it was an experiment and therefore they did give fully informed consent for their children to take part. Please don't do ethical weaknesses of sheriff saying that the boys didn't consent. The boys were aged 11 to 12 years old. They did not have to consent. It's down to parents to make that decision. So ethically, he did ask the parents for fully informed consent. Um, the boys themselves were matched when they were split into the Eagles and the Rattlers. So both the groups were matched pairs in terms of things like IQ, uh, teacher reports, behaviour and so on. So as part of the ethical elements to the procedure, it was explained to the parents that it was an experimental camp um, through the University of Oklahoma. They told them that the purpose of the camp was to see the interaction of group activities within teams and between teams. Um, it was worded uniformly, so it was given to all parents. They were told the exact same aim in order to give consent. Um, 
it was pointed out to parents that one of the main things that was going to be studied was how team members assumed and carried out initiative and responsibility and that they would be under adult supervision, which they were. Um, they were looking at um, attitudes of the boys as they participated in activities towards common goals um, and also when they competed against other boys. So he was quite open to some extent with the gaining of consent, although one of the things you can bring in as an ethical weakness a bit later on was the fact that he didn't really explain that he was going to instigate situations of conflict, competition, um, and through his experiment intentionally um, cause in-group and out-group hostility. So as I mentioned before, the two groups of boys didn't meet each other prior to the study. They had never met in schools or through um, local communities. Each of the two groups were matched against each other. So he controlled for any individual differences that may skew the results um, between the two groups. Um, they were divided equally between those two groups based on the parental information about the child teachers educational assessments, IQ tests and also athletic assessments. The way in which Sheriff gathered um, data was in four different forms. So they used observational skills um, whereby a participant observer was allocated to each group for 12 hours a day. They acted as um, camp counsellors or camp, camp supervisors um, so they were engaged with the boys, undertaking activities and also making notes about how the boys behaved, the kinds of comments they said, um, what they did and didn't do um, and how they interacted both within their group and towards their out group. He used what they call sociometrical analysis, which identifies issues such as friendship patterns and these are noted and studied. Sociometric analysis looks at how many times you might as an individual interact with a particular person, um, what that interaction is like, whether you are friendly, whether you are hostile, how many times you go over and talk to particular people and what the small groups um, and friendship circles are like. So that's looking at your sociometrics. The field experiment itself, um, there were various tasks that were set up within the field experiment. Um, for example, the boys had to collect beans, they had to estimate how much each boy had collected, they had to engage in activities like tug of war. So they were fairly normal activities that you would expect to do within a summer camp setting, um, but they were designed very specifically to, first of all, create that in-group formation and then second of all, to create that in-group, out-group competition to see if conflict would arise. Equally, the superordinate goals that were set were also quite um, common, so they had um, strong ecological validity, um, but again, they were designed and manipulated as independent variables to test um, whether or not conflict could be reduced. The final element of data collection came through tape recordings. So they had tape recordings during um, things like eating in the canteens and stuff like that, where they recorded adjectives and phrases that the boys used to refer to their own groups and also how they referred to the out-group members. Um, that's a bit like a thematic analysis of, of the keywords and comments that were used within the time at the camp um, to see if there was any sort of negative hostility um, and in-group preference. OK, so during the first five to six days of the two week summer camp programme, the two groups of boys were separated from one another and completed activities which were designed to create in group formation. So this was the initial stage to ensure that the groups um, bonded and that they had a shared sense of group formation and group identity. They didn't meet um, and were not aware of the other group during that first um stage of the experiment. Um, the camp staff, who were obviously the, the participant observers and researchers, 
listen to verbal and nonverbal communications within each of the two groups um, to ensure that relationships and bonding between those particular groups of boys were emerging. Um, sociometric data was gathered on how the boys rated each other in terms of popularity, initiative. So they would ask the boys um, questions on, you know, oh, do you think he's good at, you know, I don't know, um, activities? Um, do you think he's quite strong? And they had that kind of in-group formation. So at the end of the sixth day, they decided that the two groups had actually bonded sufficiently, um, that the in-groups had formed, and then they moved on to stage two. So the next uh, four to six days involved bringing the two groups together, so the Rattlers and the Eagles, and they were brought together as part of the camp for tournaments and competitions. So this is where they began to manipulate um, circumstances, create um, finite material resources that they could compete over, um, things like tug of war. So there was still that element of ecological validity in there. Um, they arranged it so that each group member had to compete in order to win points towards a, to a tournament total. Um, and they were put into situations that would incite frustration um, and they were told that the other group was to blame. So one thing that they did do was set up certain circumstances. So, for example, they would break something or knock something over or make a mess of something um, and tell the boys that, that it was the other group of boys that had actually um, done whatever it was and caused the problem. Um, they observed then the stereotypes that were forming between each group and the behavioural attitudes. So they recorded data about how the boys demonstrated um, outgroup derogation, hostility, how they rated them as less able, less sporty, less athletic, uh, not as good as them, and so on. So they recorded how the conflict grew and how the in-group, out-group hostility developed um, as a result of those competitions and situations of frustration. So in the final stage of Sheriff's Field experiments, um, they specifically focused on bringing the two groups of boys together in an attempt to reduce the co group conflict that had formed. Um, they created activities that were designed to promote superordinate goals. Um, and through that, it required both the groups of boys to cooperate together in order to um, resolve situations and problems that affected both of the groups in the same way. So, for example, um, the two groups had to come together to fix a water tank, um, which provided water to both of the groups. So it required more than one of them um, to be able to fix it. Um, they went on a joint camp over where they had to work together to get food and sleeping gear so that they all sort of met their own sort of basic survival needs. And they also had to fix a broken down camp bus. So it brought them all together with this idea that superordinate goals would actually reduce the levels of conflict within um, particular groups. OK, so moving on to the results of Sheriff. Um, the results for stage one. So there was evidence that the boys in each group formed their own group norms and it led to a group identity. So they took part in the cooperative activities and named themselves the Rattlers and the Eagles. At the end of the stage, the groups were made aware of each other and a very them and us kind of situation arose between the two groups. So when they reached stage two, which was when the intergroup conflict was triggered, um, the boys began to show signs of hostility towards the other group. There were leaders who emerged within each group and the groups became quite territorial over their own spaces and their own sleeping quarters. When the tournaments began, the boys began fighting, um, calling each other's names and the group of eagles burnt the rattlers camp flag. Um, 
The observers saw a strong sense of in-group favouritism and very strong negative out-group out -group bias. Um, and it resulted in derogatory terms being used um, about the other groups. So that was both of the groups um, using derogatory terms about, against the other. And when they were asked to self-report about their friends um, and sort of the, you know, the, the strongest people, the most athletic people and things like that, 93% of the boys selected exclusively boys from their own in-group. So in the final stage of Sheriff's field experiment, um, the researchers brought the two groups back together. So they had them eating together in a communal dining hall, watching films together. Um, this was not sufficient to reduce the animosity um, between the two groups. So just doing something together wasn't enough to um, reduce the in-group, out-group hostility. They instigated the tasks that involved the superordinate goals. So that was things like fixing the water tank, um, fixing the bus and so on. The boys were divided up into mixed groups, asked to identify problems. Um, the boys began to mingle and talk to each other whilst fixing things like the water supply, but it didn't last long. Um, and as soon as it was fixed and they sort of separated back into their two groups of eagles and rattlers, the name calling and animosity began again. The staff then told the boys that they could watch a movie, but they had to pay for it collectively between the two groups. Um, the payment plan was worked up and there was a reduction in hostility that was observed. So working together long term to secure a positive outcome seemed to be a stronger superordinate goal um, than just fixing an immediate problem. By the end of the study, um, the researchers reassessed the friendship choices that the boys made. Um, they did find a significant increase in the number of boys whose friendships included other boys from the out groups, and that was in comparison to the um, friendship choices that were made at the end of stage two. So your conclusion for the classic study by Sheriff, um, they concluded that there was a strong in-group identity formed initially and with the introduction of competition, the negative out-group bias quickly emerged. Um, the introduction of superordinate goals has a reunica reunification effect in reducing that negative out-group bias because it removed the competition by getting the boys to collectively work together. Now, obviously, Sheriff's conclusions um, support his theory of a realistic conflict. So you can use these conclusions as part of your evaluations of realistic conflict theory. OK, so that brings you to the end of um, the understanding of the study. If you turn your A3 sheets over, there are some strengths and weaknesses coming up. It's not all your strengths and weaknesses. Um, you need to practice at this point being able to come up with the other strengths and weaknesses that you can use based on what you know about graves and also what you know about the key features of the study. OK, so your first strength is quite an easy one. It's high in ecological validity. Um, a summer camp is a realistic place for the 11 to 12 year old boys from Oklahoma. Um, it was natural camp behaviour and it's a natural camp environment for American children. Um, it is worth mentioning in that particular element of your strengths um, that this is only ecologically valid to these particular boys. Um, in cultures and um, countries where sending children to summer camps is not a normal behaviour then this study would not have had such high ecological validity because it would have been an unusual set of circumstances for 11 to 12 year old boys to take part in. So you must remember to be really specific with that knowledge and understanding in your strengths and weaknesses and make sure you make it clear it's because they were 11 to 12 year old boys from Oklahoma and going to a summer camp is a normal event for boys within um, American culture. The second strength here is that Sheriff standardised each stage of the procedure. 
Um, the staff were only able to intervene if com in the conflict if there was a safety risk. And that was done to avoid demand characteristics. So it was done to prevent the boys guessing the aim of the studies and guessing that they were being influenced. So it avoids that um, bias and therefore increases the reliability of the data that they gathered. OK, um, number three. Uh, the use of a match pairs design. So remember, he matched the uh, 11 to 12 year old boys on their IQ, athletic performance, um, teacher feedback, parent feedback and so on. Um, and this helped reduce um, any individual differences in the participants. So it reduced any um, participant variables that might affect the data. Um, so therefore we can be more certain that the independent variables that he manipulated were what actually affected the dependent variable and a cause and effect relationship can be established between competition and conflict and also superordinate goals and reducing conflict so again this increases that element of reliability um, that your data is actually um a, you know a, a reliable measure of um, the manipulation of the ivy. It can also be used to link to construct validity because he can be more certain that he set out to test um, what he wanted to test. So by reducing all those variables, you have a higher level of construct validity in the measures taken of the dependent variable. Um, Sheriff used participant observers to record the boy's behaviour. Um, before, during and after the groups, the competitions, um, the superordinate goals and so on. Um, this wouldn't have affected the boys' behaviour significantly. Um, summer camps have camp supervisors and responsible adults at all times. So it was normal to have adults um, wandering around, engaged in the activities, working with the boys. Um, therefore, the behaviour from the group and the interactions between the boys would be a more valid um, representation of how the boys would behave in a real life situation. So moving on to a few weaknesses for you. Um, when the boys were interviewed several years later, some of the boys had said that they'd noticed the video equipment in things like the dining hall. Um, they'd seen the staff taking notes. Um, this could have led to an element of bias in the results um, in the sense that perhaps the boys didn't actually behave in a way that they should have behaved. Um, if that was the case, it would reduce the validity of um, the measures of the dependent variable um, in that the in-group and out-group conflicting behaviours would have been slightly more staged if the boys had managed to guess what what the people were actually recording and why they were recording them. The sample themselves, Sheriff used 11 to 12 year old boys from middle class Protestant backgrounds from Oklahoma. Um, they were all matched on IQ and ability, so his results are not representative of an entire population of boys to start with. This is for a number of reasons. So first of all, the fact that they are boys makes the study androcentric, so it can't be generalised to girls. The fact that they were all middle class Protestant white boys from Oklahoma also means that his results are not representative of um, upper class or working class children. Therefore, it can't be generalised to different um, classes and socioeconomic status. Um, and finally, there are 11 to 12 year old boys from America, which has an individualistic culture. Therefore, you can't generalise the results from Sheriff to the behaviour of boys from Asian communities, for example, where they have a more collectivist culture. One of the other issues with the selection of the boys to take part is that he selected boys with good athletic ability and who were keen on sport. This was 
done because of the nature of the camp and the fact that the activities were kind of things like tug of war and stuff like that. Um, however, it is a biased sample. Um, it may well be that those preferences um, for taking part in sport, being athletic, being strong, being sporty, um, could increase the degree of conflict because they would be naturally competitive boys. They may have competitive personality traits um, and you'll be able to link this further through when we do a little bit on biology. It's quite likely that they had higher testosterone levels. Um, so again, the, the bias in the sample um, causes questions with the sampling technique that was used and the sample selection. Um, at stage one, um, just knowing about the other group without being involved in competition shows and, and showing conflict um, actually supports social identity theory rather than realistic conflict theory. So it could well be that competition is not always necessary in creating conflict between the two groups. It may well be that just the presence of the two groups could be enough to form in-group, out-group hostilities. So that very first part of um, Sheriff's study is actually more appropriate as an example of a social identity theory than perhaps it is as a realistic conflict theory. So that brings you to the end of the examples I'm going to give you for your strengths and weaknesses. Your job now for the remaining part of this lesson is to add to your other um, strengths and weaknesses on the back of that A3 sheet. Pick out the key features in the study and make those connections to the different elements of graves. You've got quite enough, quite a lot for generalizability, um, but think about things like application. Um, think about the ethics in terms of the strengths there um, and the parental consent and just fill in um, those gaps on the remaining strengths and weaknesses on your A3 sheet. You can work together on that, um, split it out between yourselves and share your answers and we'll, we'll go over those next lesson. Any questions, just pop a message on Teams um, and make sure that you've finished those before we are next in.